Do you like books? I mean, really, really like books? Then you're in the right place. Each week, your host, Sam Hankin, interviews the best of today's top-selling authors and the up-and-coming superstars of modern literature. This is The Avid Reader. Here is your host, Sam Hankin. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another edition of The Avid Reader, brought to you by Wellington Square Bookshop. Our guest today is Daniel Graham, author of An Internet in Your Head, A New Paradigm for How the Brain Works, which was published by uh, Columbia University Press. Daniel is Associate Professor of Psychological Science at Hobart and William Smith Colleges. In addition to the research behind this book, Daniel's work spans computational and theoretical studies of natural vision coding in the retina and visual cortex, network science approaches to understanding dynamic activity on the connectome, and human visual aesthetics and art making from a statistical and computational perspective, all of which dovetails to a certain extent uh, into what we'll be talking about today, which is the brain. And for the last half, last half century or so, um, we have posited, as I was just talking about with Daniel, by metaphor, that the brain is like a computer. It computes, we compute. The manner in which it acts is akin to the manner in which the computer acts. This metaphor has been quite convenient for providing a substrate of sorts upon which we can build an understanding by analogy of the processes that allow us to discern a rock from a cowl or a symphony from a garbage disposal. But what if, says Daniel, our brain, perhaps in addition to a computer, is simply kind of like the node internally and externally of a larger network, much like uh, our internet, a communication net that works and acts globally and locally, and which is much more complex than we thought, but still capable of being described as and dealt with by metaphor and analogy. And that's why it's so good for not only experts, but lay people like me and the people who come into Wellington Square, Wellington Square Bookshop looking for something different. Um, and that's why I do so many Columbia University Press books. So this book lays out, as I said, so people like you and me can follow along, an argument that leads us to a better understanding of how we think, and how we act, and how that leads to our quotidian tasks and our intellectual ability to actually write a book like this. So welcome, Daniel. Thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you, Sam. It's really my pleasure. I'm really glad to be here. So here is a series of questions. They are somewhat pertinent. What in God's name are you doing at Hamburger University? <laughs> um, I, uh, you know, this, it's, a, it's a small liberal arts college. I went to a small liberal arts college. Um, I, you know, believe in the mission of uh, you know, small classes and, uh, you know, deep engagement with, uh, with your instructors, uh, undergraduate focused, um, you know, I, I have collaborators in, at, <laughs> at, at other, uh, places. Um, oh, oh, I, I'm sorry. I think you're, you're asking a different question, um, than the, <laughs> actually could, well, could you, you end up, here's better. How ah. did you end up needing a non-fast food, uh, meal <laughs> at a fast food university? Ah, okay. I thought you were talking about the, the school where I teach, but <laughs> it was a different question. Um, the uh, Hamburger University was it just happened to be the um, the host of a conference for uh, interdisciplinary uh, sort of complexity science and nonlinear dynamics and chaos, which I was uh, studying at the time as a graduate student. Um, it just happened to be a, a venue that um, I think the organizers were at Northwestern and they uh, chose this. It's a beautiful campus, and yes, they do have these um, very uh, odd paintings of kind of replicas of um, famous works of art with burgers and fries and cokes uh, inserted into them. Uh, at the uh, this is all at the McDonald's uh, corporate headquarters. Um, <laughs> so I, I thought you were going somewhere else with that, but it, uh, yes, it was a um, it was an odd experience, but the I kind of had a kind of moment of uh, of revelation there. Uh, at the time, I was a physics student and didn't really know exactly what uh, area of physics I wanted to study. I knew I wanted to do something involving complexity, involving um, studying uh, the weird and the offbeat um, uh, systems that are seemingly incomprehensible. I, I wasn't sure exactly what. Uh, area I wanted to go into, but I, um, through this program, which was led by Steve Strogatz, uh, a mathematician at Cornell, um, I came across all kinds of really interesting questions um, involving lots of stuff, 
uh, there's this kind of saying in the field that more is different. Um, that when you have more, when you have lots and lots of elements, um, and each one is fairly complex, that they behave in ways that you wouldn't be able to predict, even if you knew exactly how each one of those little pieces worked. Um, and uh, so I was kind of in this milieu and um, again, kind of feeling around and trying to find um, how, where to apply this knowledge. Um, and uh, at, at Hamburger University as part of this, this workshop, um, uh, a, a, a neuroscientist made a very offhand comment um, that struck me as really important. And he said that, no two brains are exactly alike, and that includes identical twins. Really, no, no two brains have exactly the same structure as one another. Um, the set of connections, you know, certainly in two identical twins are, are going to have very similar brains, um, but they're definitely not identical. But this also applies kind of more generally. Your brain and my brain are wired in you know, quite different ways, but we can have interactions. I can pass information on to you. You can pass information back to me. It's all perfectly comprehensible. I can be sure that um, what you see around you, or if I show you an object, um, you know, I can predict with, with pretty good accuracy what you're going to think about it and, and what you're going to experience, even though our brains are you know, different from one another. And this suggests that there are deep principles of how brains work. There are certain things you have to get right um, or else the whole thing doesn't work. And to me, that was uh, a, really a revelation. It says that you, we can start to apply some of these methods that I was learning in physics or that I had learned as a, in my training as a, in physics um, to look at you know, what's generally true. What are the basic things we can say about a brain um, or what are the prerequisites for a brain? You know, it's funny because it was like a moment of epiphany for you. And I thought, oh, it's a strange place to have it. But then I realized <laughs> I've had strange places where I've had moments of epiphany too. But so, so at that point, as you say, you said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to try to construct or build this uh, theory of intra-brain communication using the internet as a guiding metaphor. So if we go to the metaphor, which you say over and over again in the book, so you know it really is a metaphor. So what happens to the previous metaphor um, of the brain as a computer. You're not discarding it, correct? That's right. You're yeah, I think, I think it's been very useful. Um, I think it can be misleading, um, but it's certainly propelled the last 70 years or so of research and um, our knowledge now is, is really extraordinarily detailed and uh, in, in some parts of the brain. Certainly there are some parts that are more well understood than others, but um, I think it's been very useful to have some kind of machine to compare to. You know, it's funny, um, because I'm a bookseller, uh, and I say this every interview, people say you can't judge a book by its cover, but everyone who comes into the store does. And it's a great cover. It, it, it divides into compartments, a kind of workshop that deals with understanding, reason, like a call center, um, a heart, even an ear. Mm -hmm. And... So I think when people see the cover, they're going to think, oh, this is maybe whimsical, maybe somewhat humorous, but it looks like it's going to contain a lot of information about how we work. So who, who did it and how did, did you vet it? Did you think of the idea? How did that work? Yes. Um, uh, so this is a, uh, an image that I came across um, not entirely sure where. Oh, wait, wait, do you have it there? Can you can you I do, it? yes, I can, yes. Um, this is a, an image by uh, Fritz Kahn, who was a um, uh, science illustrator, science writer, uh, but really so much more than that in the 1920s in, 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 in Germany. Um, he was a social activist. He was a physician by day um, uh, and uh, you know, had really a polymath uh, thinker. Um, and yes, I love the, um, the idea that everything is kind of a machine. Um, and you're right, it, it is, is a bit whimsical. Um, I hadn't thought about putting it on the, on the cover, but my editor, Miranda Martin, had the idea that this would be a great uh, cover image. And I completely agree. I think it, it worked out really well. Um, and yeah, it, it gets across this, this notion that we have to, each little part 
um, certainly isn't isolated in the same way that it, it kind of appears uh, in this image. There, are, there aren't these kind of strict compartments for most things, um, but there do have to be various goals, right? When I think this is an important way of thinking about machines and metaphors is, is we're trying to come up with some kind of reference system that has a goal of its own. Um, and then see how, how does it accomplish that goal? What are the elements that it has to, to work with? Um, of course, what are the differences between the two systems? But what can we learn from those kind of basic strategies of how does that other thing accomplish what it needs to accomplish um, efficiently and uh, effectively? You know, it's funny because kind of semi playing devil's advocate, but also basically because of a misunderstanding on my part. So you look at the cover, and as you said, it's a German illustrator. So the first thing I do was, oh, I got to translate these. <laughs> so I, go to Google, I go to Google Translate and I know what they are. So I'm thinking, wait a minute, this metaphor doesn't work. I don't know German, but all I got to do within seconds is ask Google, hey, yeah, tell me what's going on. What is this? So, so then I'm thinking, wait a minute, where this metaphor breaks down because Google knows lots more than I do and gives the answers in a much faster time than I could do, even if I had a relative fluency in German. So then I thought, wait a minute, this doesn't work. Tell me why I'm wrong. Yeah, um, I, th I think this is a, a really good question. Um, but you could also turn it around and say, well, you know, maybe we're not giving the internet enough credit as a kind of conscious or intelligent entity. Um, maybe it, it already has some of that um, ability to predict, ability to share information very widely, to influence the world around it. Um, you know, I, <laughs> I think we could, we could just as well ask, ask that sort of question. Um, you know, I, I think you're right that um, the, the things that we do with the internet are, are not necessarily um, a, the right point for the, for the metaphor. Other people have made these kinds of uh, points. Um, the idea that uh, web pages are uh, kind of organized in a way that's sort of like our memory or um, the way we stitch knowledge together and link ideas together. And so there are a few other people who have come up with that kind of analogy. And I think it, I think it does work to some extent, um, but really I'm interested in the basic infrastructure of communication. How do you get a message from over here to over there successfully when there's lots of other messages that are traveling around? Um, and that's the place where not only is there a kind of deeper theory uh, that the internet is founded on, but that's also a big problem that the brain faces, right? We, we have all these 86 billion neurons and they need to talk to one another. And there needs, some kind of, needs to be some kind of overarching scheme for managing that system of communication. So I well, think you know, that there's, yeah, go ahead. Well, I was gonna say, um, you said the word consciousness and again, kind of, pointing you know like trying to point at the sore spot on you like people do it's like okay you say consciousness and then the afterward you kind of i'm not saying you dance around it but you do say you do imply if not express that there may be a, a kind of consciousness in this internet which is what elon musk and a lot of people are attempting to accomplish but in my mind consciousness implies a self-awareness of your own existence that's the way I look yeah. at it. And you are suggesting, are you not, that that is where we are going if we haven't fundamentally reached that point? Yeah, I mean, I, I wanna say that there's definitely big differences between whatever kind of consciousness we have and you know, positing that there might be a consciousness in the internet. But I think um, you know, this, this point about self-awareness is a really important one. Um, and, I think you could make the argument that the internet is also self-aware. It monitors itself. Each element is in contact with other elements around it. And so here I'm talking about routers, um, talking to other routers. And so they let each other know that, hey, I'm, I'm in service now, you can send me messages. Um, or they also share uh, information about how to get other places that are further away. Um, these are kind of paths that are currently um, good ones to take. Um, so it's constantly moder monitoring itself. Um, anytime a message is sent, a message is sent backwards to say, hey, I got that message. Um, there's all kinds of kind of internal verifications. And 
of course, these are just <clears throat> little blips, um, little uh, 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 changes in voltage on uh, wires and uh, little flashes of light in a fiber optic uh, cable. But, you know, what our neurons are doing is really just moving ions around. <laughs> uh, they're the, the whole, the whole, in both cases, you're kind of just moving electrons uh, in, in different ways. So, I mean, you can break down the brain into these kind of absolutely non-thinking elements. Um, and you can do the same thing with the internet. It's just that we know that, well, we, we assume because we feel consciousness that it's something special, right? And that it's, that it's uh, only, only we or maybe a few other uh, or, or other animals um, can experience. But I think it's worth taking seriously the, uh, this question of, again, when there's more, right? When there's lots and lots of things and they have these ways of interacting with one another and, and the whole system can monitor itself and kind of uh, be, a, I don't know if it's aware, but if it has some way of uh, fixing itself without someone else kind of looking down and saying, okay, there's a problem here, we need to fix it here. It does this all itself. There's no center of the internet, which is, I think, one of the main things that I like about the metaphor. If you go back to the first metaphor on which you build, the one that's been around for 50 or 60 years, that we're just like a computer, then I thought, initially, where the metaphor breaks down is we created computers. Just like take cars, for example. They have a musculoskeletal system. They have a respiratory system. They have a circulatory system. They have a digestive system, yes. an excretory system, a nervous system. With, with Teslas and Elon Musk, they can see. Mm -hmm. um, so we created cars. We created computers. Isn't that metaphor going, for want of a better word, ass backwards? I mean, <laughs> it's like if, you, if you're religious, you believe that God created us. Well, then, then who is messing around with God to create a metaphor to allow him to exist? Am I, do you, know, you see what I mean? Yeah, no, I see. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, the, the point is that um, uh, only things that kind of evolve uh, through natural selection, if you, you know, if, if you think that's where the, uh, yeah. the, um, uh, the origin uh, lies, and you know, I certainly um, believe that. Um, but I think, you know, again, with, with the internet, it's something that evolves, uh, uh, not biologically, but um, through the collective actions of lots of people. Um, so when um, new capabilities are, uh, are enabled, um, really a lot of it came down to the, the kind of first people who uh, came up with these, these deeper theories about how to, how to link uh, entities together in a very complex network. Um, and they built it so that it could do lots of different things. So it could handle, um, you know, the video call that we're on right now. It's using, ex exploiting a lot, the same basic tricks or the same uh, kind of principles or strategies that um, were used to uh, kind of build it in, in the first place. But you're right, there's, there, there is, it does seem to be a category difference between um, things that evolve to have consciousness um, and things that are, created by us for some purpose and where we select the elements that we want it to have. But I think in, in its behavior, you know, a car, a car is a much more predictable thing than the internet, <clears throat> excuse me. So, um, you know, it, it's more deterministic. In other words, when you push on the accelerator, you're gonna go a, a certain speed, right? And, and you could calculate out, you know, based on the driving conditions and the hill that you're on or whatever, um, you know, pretty precisely what's gonna happen. Um, every time, right? It should it should always be um, very similar. But the internet is a really different type of machine that um, it was definitely engineered, but it also evolves on its own. And it also a lot of trust is given to to it on its own, right? So certainly humans do have to intervene from time to time, um, but generally not with the actual workings of passing messages. It's usually when like a squirrel chews through a wire or something like that, that we, that humans have to get involved. Um, and even today, um, you know, a connectable device can join the network on its own. Um, and so the internet doesn't necessarily need us. It, it, it needs us sometimes, but for that basic message passing task, 
um, and for allowing new uh, senders and receivers to join, this seems to be something that it can do on its own. Which is the scary part. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm not saying this is necessarily a good thing. <laughs> the other thing that was really, it's a great book. And this is the other thing that makes it really good is that when you said natural selection, so you bring Darwin into it, who knew nothing about the, the internet, you bring Leibniz into it, you bring my hero, Oliver Sacks into it. Um, so what allowed you to weave these individuals to buttress the concept that we indeed are part and parcel of this metaphor? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think a lot of it comes down to uh, the complexity of the thing and that we're, we have to come at it from lots of different angles. Um, another, uh, you know, maybe starting with Darwin, um, after this kind of initial epiphany that even though brains are different, there seem to be common strategies or common uh, protocols that, that, that brains require. Um, you know, we certainly see uh, very similar uh, patterns of, uh, of, of evolution in, in certain lineages in, in, the, in the mammal lineage, right? So we think of our brains and um, the macaque monkey's brain is, is quite similar to one another. That's why we use it as a kind of model organism, um, to especially to study vision. Um, but uh, evolution kind of gives us something more. It gives us a kind of lever to pry open um, the secrets of, of the brain because we know that um, we know the, a lot of these relationships, right? We know that there has to be this kind of um, process of turning uh, energy from the environment into more and more diverse animals uh, and generally bigger animals. Um, animals with bigger brains and that have more uh, capabilities. And so there's this kind of, you know, it is definitely misleading to think of, of evolution as a human engineer or any kind of, of engineer, but there is a kind of engineering that goes into it. And this, uh, this uh, thought or this idea, um, I think gives us some leverage because we can say, well, you know, if you were going to design a system, um, from scratch to do the job that the brain does, which is to interconnect these 86 billion neurons and to allow them to communicate and to allow you to integrate, for example, vision and hearing at the same time, or to make a decision and, uh, and have that uh, end up at the right place or the right kind of output. Um, well, you know, how would you do that kind of, how would you approach that engineering problem? Um, and then we can, make this uh, leap and say that, well, if you come up with a good solution for that, and if it's really efficient, um, and it has a lot of the same sort of qualities as uh, what the brain does, well, maybe that's what the brain actually does. Um, and so this way of thinking of saying, well, you know, what is the problem that we need to solve? And then how would be, what would be the best way to solve that problem uh, from a kind of theoretical point of view? And then transfer that over to uh, the nuts and bolts of what you have available in terms of the different types of neurons and how they're connected to one another. Um, and you mentioned animals, and I love it when someone brings up fruit flies, and <laughs> because you know they get a bad rap, but you know they pretty much are the basis of a lot of stuff we know. And, you know, you, you know they first did the fruit fly genome, and now we have the human genome. But but what you're talking about, what they did with the fruit fly, is something completely different. Uh, talk about what that is and what that means for us and what it could mean in the future. Yeah, so the fruit fly has now been, uh, has by far the, the most comprehensive connectome. So this is where you uh, take the brain and you uh, figure out all, how everything is connected to everything else. Um, so obviously you can't have every neuron connected to every single other neuron. If, if you did that in our brain, we would have a brain that's 20 kilometers wide. Um, but so it's, it's a non-trivial problem. How, how are things really connected? And you know, at, at a gross level, we know um, certain pathways, but it's only been in, in more recently that we've developed ways, uh, and when I say we, I mean scientists who, who do this. This is not uh, my, my area of work, but um, the kind of networks that they 
uh, are able to produce with this kind of research um, uh, are the basis of, of what I do in terms of uh, kind of modeling. Um, but it's, it's, very, it's a very challenging problem. Um, essentially what you have to do is you have to take the brain and kind of slice out uh, um, little slices and then trace the axons and all the connections as they weave through each of these slices. Um, and actually what they do for the, um, uh, for the fruit fly, because it's very small, they can kind of uh, take a picture of one uh, slice and then kind of etch it away um, using uh, an electron microscope and then the scan the next layer and then the next layer and the next and then trace all the weaving fibers as they go through there and there are um, uh, huge numbers of neurons that or, or, or uh, groups of neurons that we can see are connected to one another now um, I, it's, it's a it's kind of a daunting thing um, honestly the uh, just to see how uh, how intricate the connections are in in a fruit fly, right? You know, they have a relatively limited behavioral repertoire. Um, they um, don't live very long, um, but still, they have this phenomenally complex brain um, that allows them to fly even when it's windy and to seek out food sources and to reproduce and to do really quite a lot of uh, complex stuff. Um, and so, I don't think it's necessary. I don't think we should necessarily start with the fruit fly. Um, Partly because it's, it's it's a little bit of overload to say to seeing how how much complexity there is there. Um, so for myself, you know, we we tend to look at uh, kind of larger groupings of uh, of brain parts. So we look at the mouse and we look at the monkey um, and see how the you know 300, 500 or so brain areas are connected to one another. Um, and and in this we also know. Uh, how many connections there are. In other words, how thick are those cables between uh, different areas? And so we're, we're kind of trying to figure out what are the general um, uh, rules by which message passing happens? Because the, the, basic, uh, the basic difficulty, or maybe it's an advantage in the brain is that everything is very close to everything else on the network. So in other words, it's sort of like the six degrees of separation, um, where you know everyone is the uh, everyone is six degrees away from Kevin Bacon, or, or every actor uh, in Hollywood is six degrees, uh, six movies away from uh, Kevin Bacon. Um, for human friendships, it's actually more like four. Uh, for neurons, um, we don't have a a good estimate of how close any given neuron is to any other neuron in the brain. I think for most neurons, it's probably about three or four, but certainly for the um, for these brain areas, so you know, 300 or so brain areas, 500 maybe in humans, um, the distance is about two. Uh, so you can, uh, most brain areas are directly connected to, or many brain areas are directly connected to one another, but if you go two hops, then you can get just about everywhere. And that is, so how you manage that um, and again, kind of getting back to this evolution question, um, you need a really efficient strategy. And that's one thing that evolution does really well is it pairs down uh, the problem into, uh, and, and figures out a way to, uh, to, to manage this kind of thing and to allow growth in the system also, right? So it has to work not only for a mouse, but also for everything that came between, um, you know, our common ancestors with mice and us, right? So it has to be able to scale up. Glad you brought Kevin Bacon into it because now we're kind of six degrees if we became actors. Um, so here, <laughs> I, I tend to jump around. So here's something that I've interviewed lots of guys, neuroscientists and philosophers and psychologists who talk about uh, human consciousness. And I always get them pissed off because I always say, what if it's a solipsistic universe? And then basically only one of us is talking, but I don't know which one. <laughs> and then that screws up their whole theory because it, it doesn't work. So <laughs> that reminds me of like this idea of you are studying a tool with the very tool that you're studying. And so it's like, it's two different ways you can look at it. Placing a guitar next to an amplifier and you get this incredible mm -hmm. distortion. Or suppose your electric drill breaks and you need to unscrew a component of the electric grill using the electric grill to unscrew the component that needs repair. So you can't get outside. You're inside and you're stuck yes. there. So doesn't that imply to you that there's some type of, you know, 
doesn't that imply some type of question in your head as to, wait a minute, is this right? Can I actually do this, what I'm trying to accomplish? I, I mean, I think there are an increasing number of people in computational systems neuroscience who would, who, who would not dismiss the solipsistic universe uh, idea anymore. Um, and are, are some of them in a relatively small number, you know, it's hard to get a sense of these things, but you know, you, you hear um, more and more people, I would say, still a minority opinion, but thinking that, you know, you know I, I can't prove that, that you're really there, right? Um, but to me, it seems like a lot of work to go through for, for just one guy. <laughs> That's the thing, if it was a solipsistic universe, we'd still be saying the same things. <laughs> so there you go. Well, that yeah. goes to, uh, um, well, that's the other one is Descartes. Right. So well, uh, a certain amount of basis of this is, is concerned with the Cartesian duality. So it's a mind brain thing. You're talking about the brain, but then uh, because your task is not to bring it in there, but I'm asking you to bring the mind into it because, and oh, you do say ghost in the machine once. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's kind of it, right? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think we're all looking for that ineffable thing that, um, that makes the brain work. And, you know, for most scientists, we, we think that that's some very clever evolutionary trick or some kind of computation. Um, you know, a lot of, there's a lot of discussion really just right now about, um, you know, deep learning and uh, artificial intelligence and neural networks that are artificial neural networks and these sorts of things. Um, and, you know, kind of what makes them tick? Do they have some kind of special secret sauce that allows them to work uh, so well for certain types of problems? Um, and, uh, you know, they're, they're very hard to scrutinize also, again, because they have lots and lots of elements. Um, and we don't really quite know how to analyze uh, you know, systems of millions and millions or billions of elements um, when they're all behaving in kind of complex ways, right? If it's, it's, a, if it's a glass of water, it's got a lot more elements, but, you know, they're, they behave in ways that we do understand because each atom is relatively simpler, I guess. Um, so, yeah, where, where does the mind come in? Um, I, I don't think that there is any mystical force that is, I don't think there is any separation between that, the, uh, the workings of the brain and what we are experiencing. And I don't think that it's, it's just me here <laughs> experiencing this, um, you know, partly just for parsimony, right? That it would, you know, uh, you could come up with other sorts of systems. I, uh, I don't know, it, it, it's a difficult question, but, it is. <laughs> and I can see why it, you know, <laughs> would be a recurring one. Um, I think um, one nice one one thing that I like about thinking in terms of the internet is that it's totally distributed, right? That there is no central actor, um, and you know this this feeling of kind of the unity of consciousness. Um, that part, at least, we know is an illusion um, because you know it has to be that um, you know it take first of all it takes time for signals to propagate from your sensory system into the different parts of the brain where things are analyzed. So there's always a little bit of delay, right? It feels like everything right now is um, happening right now, but this also applies for how different parts of the brain communicate with one another. This isn't like special, this isn't uh, relativity here. This is just the mere fact that getting information from one place to another takes time and neurons are relatively slow compared to say an electrical wire. And so, um, this kind of asynchronous um, entity that doesn't have a center, that doesn't have a central control unit, um, that's passing messages that take a bit of time to, to get places, um, you know, that, that's something that the internet also does. How, what, what arises from that? Maybe nothing arises from that in, in a computer network, but in us, you know, there may be something extra uh, in the way that it's connected and in the way that um, those signals are pulled together um, that feels like consciousness, that feels like one consciousness. Well, the interesting thing you mentioned in this, your explanation was deep. And then I thought of, you know, what, what was originally deep thought and then became deep blue. And uh, 
And then Kasparov being all upset because he was he was basically accusing Deep Blue of cheating. And so talk about, you know, people don't, they think about this deep and they know it's something and they know it implies a more complex and somewhat ethereal, in my mind, um, approach to this. So talk, you could just start with Deep Blue because people know about it. They know what yeah. it is. Sure. I mean, so this is a, a, a computer AI chess engine um, that uh, really just kind of solves the problem by brute force. So it looks at any chess board um, and it calculates all the possible moves and based on uh, other chess games that it's seen uh, or uh, in the original instantiation, it doesn't even uh, kind of know anything other than um, the other moves that, that the opponent could make. And it just calculates the likelihoods of, of each of those things. And, it's, and it chooses the most likely thing. And it does this uh, every single time. Um, but you know, the just astronomical numbers of possible chess games. Um, but if you have enough computational power, you can figure out those, those uh, statistical likelihoods. Um, and then you can beat anybody at chess. And you know, I, I think it's certainly very impressive. Um, but chess is a very limited space, right? So we, you only have 64 places on the board where you can be, and you have uh, 16 pieces each. Um, so, and there's very strict rules about how everything can move, and there's a limited number of rules. Um, so I, in these kinds of questions, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm honestly not very surprised. Uh, you know, I think it's a very impressive feat uh, of engineering, certainly. But I'm not surprised that that computers are able to do this, and they can do this for Go. Um, they can do it for yeah. very for very simple uh, video games like Atari games. Um, but there are, but um, something like recognizing um, a coffee mug is a much more difficult problem. And uh, I have to say that computers have gotten much better at this. But again, by just kind of using brute force, um, uh, and they require a tremendous amount of training. Um, even to just recognize one one coffee mug, or 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 to do some sort of a similar task of recognizing a, a limited set of objects, um, we do this every day um, without much effort at all. Um, and and this kind of um, ability is shared very widely across humans. There's it's object recognition is something that basically all sighted humans have, and we have very similar. Um, abilities, it's a very difficult thing to knock out, right? Because our brains are um, built, or at least our, the visual parts of our brains are very much built around objects and finding the objects, knowing how objects are going to move, what we can do with an object, how you would reach it and pick it up, and the sort of things you could do with it um, in, in ways that, you know, if you're a fish, uh, your objects are less important to you. Um, you're kind of mainly concerned with Staying with your school, uh, you know, staying in, uh, in the right place in the water column, um, finding some food, and, and doing these sorts of things. So, so our uh, these kind of I would say very difficult problems of especially object recognition um, are things that uh, these computers are definitely getting better at, uh, and, and these AI systems um, are getting better at. Um, but I think uh, they are, they're going to be limited for, for a long time to come. Um, and they're not using a strategy that's like the brain, uh, in my opinion. And there's, there's a lot of debate about this. But, I, but um, the amount of training that's required to get to a point where you can recognize, for example, faces or, or, or objects um, is, is, is huge. And to solve all, you know, there's, there's various estimates about how much, even just how much electricity it uses. Um, and it's something like um, uh, using five cars for for a year, uh, driving the you know typical distance that American uh, drives, just to train one of these models to do uh, something like object rec recognition. Um, so I, I I don't think it's I think it's impressive, and and we may see improvements and and, and greater efficiency. But I think these problems that are very multi dimensional, which are very different from chess, where where you have all the different dimensions of the colors and arrangements and sizes and shapes and textures of objects that we see around us. This is a, a much more uh, multi-dimensional problem than chess. 
It's funny because uh, after I was reading about the coffee cup, I started seeing things like I was looking for my glasses, my reading glasses. Uh, yeah, right here. Mm -hmm. And so I was looking upstairs and I saw a pair of glasses and I walked towards them. And then I realized those were my distance glasses, those were my <laughs> reading glasses. But my brain was looking at it, it looked appropriately shaped, it looked mm -hmm. appropriately colored. And then it made the decision that no, you're looking in the wrong place. Those aren't them. Let's eliminate that for the time. No, let's eliminate it completely and move on, which reminded me of Deep Blue because, and I play poker, but this, it was like when uh, Kasparov lost because the computer made a mistake and he's looking <laughs> at that. Wait a minute. It's not, it can't make a mistake. So it's like if you're playing poker with someone who never, ever bluffs and you know, he doesn't bluff. He's never bluffed once. And he makes the mistake of thinking he has something he doesn't actually have. So he's all excited. So hmm. he, he has a good hand there. I think the metaphor kind of breaks down there because I think it kind of breaks down there. In, in the sense that, um, that machines are uh, theoretically are not error. Infallible. Right. Yeah, so it makes a mistake because a fuse blows or a wire phrase or something happens. Yeah. Whereas humans can purposefully do that, specifically because they know the other human is going to receive it as something completely different than what is pur purposefully done by the first one in order to prevail in like a zero a zero sum game. I think it. Uh, I think it comes down to something like creativity. Uh, and, and this is maybe the thing that's missing in the, and, and where I think you're right, that, that, that um, the metaphor breaks down. Um, the, I, feel like I feel like I've won. <laughs> no, I, I, I would never say that the metaphor is perfect. And, and I don't, I, 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 think, I think it's a tool. It's, it's a way of refocusing our attention uh, somewhere else, imagining different images, different uh, kind of frameworks to build upon. Um, but it's not going to be exactly right in, in all of its particulars. Um, and, you know, it may be also the case that the deeper metaphor of the organism as a machine and the universe as a machine, that may also be, you know, misleading at, at a very fundamental level. And this is kind of something that physicists are dealing with right now. Um, what is that kind of fundamental structure? Um, uh, if you're thinking about kind of quantum mechanics and, and how do we, what is the role of the observer, right? Um, you know, in quantum mechanics, anything can happen until you look at it and then that one thing happens, right? It's yeah, the, the wave, wave function, yeah, the wave function collapses, Schrodinger's cat. Normal. Exactly. And, but who's the observer and does it really require that observer? And so this is something that the physicists have come up with a variety of answers to this. Uh, the answer that I like best is something that, uh, an idea that uh, Carlo Rovelli, uh, you might have some of his books um, really wonderful. Uh, yeah, I, I interviewed him. I interviewed oh, him. There's two new books on my front table that he's written. They're fantastic. Right. <laughs> um, but his idea is, is you know, that, that there's an interaction. There's it, it, the fundamental thing that's happening is interactions among um, entities, and that there is no observer. There's no uh, observing is is not something that plays any role in this. It's it's just the the universe is created by the those interactions. Um, but to kind of get back to your, which I I, I see as, you know, at least resonant uh, or consonant with the internet metaphor that, um, that it's these interactions, it's the, the message sending, the message passing, that's the really important thing going on in brains. Um, but your initial question, um, which was about, um, sorry, remind me again, the- Yeah, it's like the breakdown because there are areas in which human beings can exceed or yes. step out, or step outside step yes. outside of your metaphor because they're doing something that doesn't coincide with what you're positing. It's like, okay, yeah. It's like when Feynman, another one of my heroes says you're studying chess and you think you understand the whole thing and then someone castles and you go, what the hell is that? <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yeah, and so this is, I think the creativity is, is really the thing that 
you know, when, it, when Deep Blue is solving this problem, it's enumerating all possibilities. It's, you know, it, it's not a creative act in any way. It's, it's simply just, a, uh, just running an algorithm. Whereas creativity, um, which is really what science is based on, it's about kind of coming up with new ideas that build upon, but also challenge those previous ideas. Um, creativity is, it, it, it's, it's, st it's still a function of the humans that it comes from, right? So uh, an idea might be especially creative if the existing ideas um, are pretty far away from it, right? So there's, there, in other words, there's no um, kind of guaranteed direction to go uh, and be creative. Um, in from a, a, a kind of mechanical point of view. You can't say, okay, the next, the most creative thing I can do now, given the system as it is here, is to go over there. Um, it's really a kind of a wind, more of a winding path of kind of human thought. And actually this is a big question that I'm interested in, in my kind of separate area of work on visual aesthetics and why we like the, the pictures that we like and the scenes that we like. Um, you may have seen these um, text to image generators. Uh, there's oh, yeah. one called Dolly uh, that are very impressive. Um, and you tell it, uh, you know, show me a, a chihuahua playing a, a trumpet with flames coming out of it or something like that. Um, and it will come up with a, a quite a sensible image of that. Um, and uh, based on the 65 million images that it's been trained on, it's learned about kind of image structure and uh, lighting and, and textures and these sorts of things. And it's, it's really quite impressive, but what makes it interesting is also um, that, or, or, or I think maybe one, one limitation is that it needs that human to say, okay, this is gonna be a funny or interesting thing that, that I'm gonna trick the computer into doing. <laughs> yeah, the, yeah, I was just reading yesterday about Google's Imogen and it's not released to the public yet, but they show examples on the site, you know, show me a rooster with a gold beak uh, sitting on top of a dog's head at a circus. Yeah. <laughs> and it, well, but again, what it is, is uh, well, actually, did you read the article last week about the quantum scientists? I can't remember where they are, who isolated trapped 16 atoms, a uh, trapped 16 atoms. And the problem was that when they trap 16 atoms in an attempt to create a quantum computer, there's it's error prone. And so they came up with an algorithm that reduces the possibility of error, all of which I can't understand. Hmm. All I know is that they trapped 16 atoms, which reminds me of the fact that what you're talking about doesn't necessarily require a lot of essentially mass mm -hmm. once you get your iterations. But okay, what my point was exactly was how do you, what is your, the part of your metaphor that allows the network not to make errors? Who's, who's the gatekeeper? Who's the guy yeah. watching saying, you know, no, I, I don't think that's the right way to go. I think, you know. Yeah, this is the real genius of the internet is the kind of bag of tricks for exactly this problem. Um, and again, it's all distributed. There's no central guy looking down and saying, okay, that message didn't make it over there. You got to resend it. Um, one thing, it, part of it has to do with the structure of the network. You have this massively interconnected thing, um, where again, you know, there's short paths. Uh, it's a little bit longer. Uh, the, the path from, say, my computer to your computer um, is more than four or six. It's probably more like ten, twelve, or, or maybe even a little bit more. Um, but it's it's relatively short, and there's lots of uh, redundant paths. In other words, there's a variety of different ways that that those messages could go, and all get to you in about the same time. Um, so one thing is just the way that the whole thing is connected. It's not a star shape network, which is to say there's a central uh, station or a central switchboard and everything is connected to that one switchboard. And maybe you have a couple of switchboards connected to each other. That's, you know, that's a telephone system and that's fine for, for telephone uh, interactions. And it's nice because you have a, a exclusive uh, connection to, to the party that you're talking to and you can, use the connection or not, um, but it's not very good. It's, it's not redundant, right? So you can't send any other messages by that channel while you're on the phone, right? Um, it's also not like a lattice, which is to say everyone's just connected to their nearest neighbor. In that case, yes, there are um, uh, lots of alternate paths, but they're gonna be quite long. You're gonna, uh, going anywhere, it's gonna take more than just a few hops, right? Because you're only connected to the 
to the people nearest you. So really, if you kind of combine those two types of networks or you take a hybrid, then you have everybody's connected to their to most of their nearest neighbors, but then there are also connections, kind of random connections um, between individuals in a given cluster uh, or uh, nodes that tend to be more like hubs. And just building a few of the, a relatively small number of those um, shortcuts uh, across different parts of the network allows you to have this kind of small world structure where you can get anywhere from anywhere else in just a few hops. And so that means that if there's congestion on one of the channels between me and you, um, some computer is malfunctioning, a, you know, squirrels, lightning, whatever, uh, there are gonna be other pathways that, that these messages can take. Um, and this is where the kind of self-awareness or the kind of um, heartbeat of the internet comes in where each individual router is talking to its neighbors and saying, hey, I'm here, you can send messages here. Um, also, I know about some good paths to get to these other locations that you might be interested in sending your messages to. Um, and so here's that list of uh, paths. These are called routing tables and they're shared among uh, routers. Um, and so getting where you wanna go, there's lots of different paths and each, everywhere on every uh, intermediary on those paths is aware of the situation. Um, if for some reason a message doesn't make it, um, then there are additional um, fail safes. Um, so one of them is that the internet assumes that um, it's waiting for, once you send a message, like so as I'm sending my packets to you, right? So my, my video is chopped up into little packets and sent across the internet to you. Um, each one of, uh, after, after some tranche of packets goes from one router to another router, there's a message uh, sent back to the sender, a kind of return receipt message saying, hey, I got that tranche of messages. Um, everything is good. You can keep sending uh, your messages. Um, if that, it's called an acknowledgement or an ACK, if, if that's not sent, then the sender will resend those lost packets. It will assume, I, okay, I didn't get that return receipt. Um, I'm just gonna assume that the message was lost. So I'm going to send that tranche of packets one more time and it should get through. Um, and there, you know, there's lots of other sorts of things that can happen. What happens if two messages bump into one another? Uh, they arrive at exactly the same time um, at some router. Well, again, there are uh, very clever solutions for this. Um, Basically, again, you know, the, luckily, both of the senders keep a copy of that sent message for a brief period of time, just to make sure that they get that act, that acknowledgement. But when they, if they bump into one another, then the receiver says, okay, you guys have to stop sending your messages uh, for, for a brief moment, and I'm gonna flip a coin, and whichever one of you wins, you can send your message, and the other one has to wait a little longer. It's and, funny, but... Um... It's funny that here's how we do it. You're talking and you're about to say ack. At the same moment, I'm thinking ack. So we're doing exactly the same thing. Had you failed to mention ack, that would be the next thing I would have said. And that's yes. <laughs> it's exactly what you were talking. Plus the ghost in the machine is, I know it's the exact same thing we were talking about when we were talking about it. I know that because I was aware of it and I watched it just like my glasses. The other thing is, and then I'll go another, my, I guess, closing question um, is that uh, Oliver Sacks again, you know, talks about the human body and the brain can do that same thing as rebuild pathways if there's trauma before. Um, okay, so here's a good one. So every sports bar has like trivia night on Wednesday night. And if you go by yourself, unless you're a polymath, you're probably gonna, well, you will lose because there's all these other teams. Mm -hmm. And this goes to what you're saying. You bring six of your friends who are pretty smart. One's good at sports, one's good at opera, one's good at uh, geography. And if you have all those there, a six to eight person team, especially, especially if you haven't drunk too much beer, which also <laughs> is something else. That, I don't even know where I would go with that. I just thought of that beer and the <laughs> Never mind, but, uh, <laughs> but yeah, if you go with those eight people, there's a very likely chance that you're gonna win. 
And that's kind of what you're talking about. I think it's a little off, but it's kind of what you're talking about, right? Yeah, again, it requires communication. It requires sharing information very widely. And, you know, this is the, uh, the way that science uh, has progressed um, is very often through reduction, right? L focusing on one item that you can, or, or one system that you can carve out from the larger system. And this has been very successful, I think, for, for brains. Uh, you know, we certainly don't have a full understanding of brains, but we've made a surprisingly uh, large amount of progress. Uh, especially in the last seven years, and especially thinking about the, the brain as, as a computer. But it's that, um, why, that wide sharing, that kind of extemporaneous and creative sharing of information um, that still, you know, still plays by rules. There are still um, there's particular information that you're trying to extract and to try to share, right? And the way that you get to that information, you know, in, in the sports trivia or the, the tri trivia night uh, example, you know, everyone's going to have their own kind of route to that, to, to the answer. Maybe they read it, maybe they uh, just are intuiting it based on some other thing that they know. Um, but I, I think that that, that, um, that dynamism is something that, that, that we really need to deal more with in neuroscience. This, uh, the brain is never the same from one moment to the next. Um, and the internet is never the same from one moment to the next. You, it doesn't have the same kind of determinism or, or they, they both have a kind of non-determinism where um, everything depends on the current moment. And sure, there are going to be, uh, you know, maybe this is what makes it so difficult to study is that you're, you're only seeing a brief snapshot when you're looking at um, a human coming in uh, to a psychology lab, right? You see them at one moment in time, um, but yet there's, they have this whole lifetime that kind of brought them there. Um, and I remember moving from physics to psychology, that this was a very odd sort of thing that you could just come up with a list of questions um, to ask somebody and then some system of scoring them and hand it to them and they would dutifully fill it out. And then, you know, you put it, the numbers into your Excel spreadsheet and then you have data. Right? And this was a very strange thing where, you know, to me, data was how many photons or, you know, what wavelength or, or you know, some small number of, of things that, that you know how to measure. And with humans, you can measure all kinds of different things. Um, and uh, the, so th this is what makes it challenging to figure out what are those basic principles that allow us to have this conversation, given that there is this whole uh, universe of different types of behaviors of creativity that we can each individually bring, um, but still uh, make it understandable to others. That, well, that was my, I mean, that was a good answer to my last question. And like, I, we've been talking well over an hour, people would listen to you for over an hour, but I know from experience, there's no way they're listening to me <laughs> talk for an hour. So in any event, um, Last thing I usually say is because it's the bookstore again. So this book is an easy book to sell because you can go out from behind the counter, show the cover and the cover alone. And that's why publishers pick covers because they want to sell the book. Yes. <laughs> but, in any, but in any event, thanks so much for coming by today. I really appreciate absolutely. it. Like I said, I could continue to talk and and I'm sure you could too, but, uh, absolutely. Okay. <laughs> but it was a pleasure talking to you today. Thank you so much. It was my pleasure. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye.